art and culture. These two words, in their broadest sense, are the real thing at Louis Vuitton. Fashion shows, collaborations, openings, exhibitions. Ever wondered who's behind every hot moment at the Maison? I'm Luc Prigent, and I'm delighted to be your eyes, ears, and voice with a very French accent to extend your cultural perspectives and broaden your horizons. You are listening to Extended, the Louis Vuitton podcast. Welcome, and I hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello, today I'll be taking you with me to Anières sur Seine, just outside of Paris. In the 19th century, the presence of a waterway and port made it an ideal location for the outdoor cafes, restaurants, and guinguettes. Also for canoeing, but above all, it was ideal for transport. It was for this reason that Louis Vuitton, Monsieur Louis Vuitton, set up his workshops here in 1859. More than one and a half centuries later, the workshops are here, part family home, part production area, and part exhibition space, of course. The place is overflowing with creativity, and as a matter of fact, until February the 27th, 2024, the gallery will be hosting the Mal Courrier exhibition, a piece emblematic of the savoir-faire of the Maison, created in 1858 and patented in 1867. It embodies the art of travel. I hope to unlock some of its secrets today. I'm almost there. I'm on Rue Louis Vuitton the street named after Louis Vuitton. And I'm about to meet Pierre-Louis Vuitton. That's his name. He's a sixth generation descendant of the illustrious trunk maker. Hello, Loïc. Good morning. Welcome. This is the Maison de Famille. Thank you. There is only the finest detailing all over this place. Where the Louis Vuitton once lived, passed down from father to son since 1854. Did you live here? I didn't grow up here for long, about 10 years. I have a few memories. Did you walk up these stairs? Well, the house changed a lot. Oh, right. It really has changed a lot. I knew the Louis Vuitton workshop. It was a fairly old workshop. The Maison de Famille was used more as an archive room. Right. Gaston was a big collector, so he needed space. And the collection was in here? In here, yes. All the rooms had pieces from Gaston's collection, and there were bedrooms upstairs. Who slept here? Louis and George actually slept in this house. Louis, the Louis. The Louis Vuitton. Yes, Louis built his house here. Okay, and he slept over here? He slept in this house. George would live in this house and Gaston. And at some point, he would have a house built a little further away. So Gaston actually went to live away from the house. But, you know, from my view, only Louis and George truly lived here. And when I knew this house, the workshop was a manufacturing site. And the only people who lived here were people involved in the manufacturing. So my father and my grandfather. And the employees. And the employees. How many approximately? Uh, in Anières, there were always between 100 and 200 people. Can you tell me about the names at Louis Vuitton? So, yeah, <laughs> there was Louis, there was George. George, just George. His only name was George. Gaston said at some point, I want to pay tribute to my grandfather, so he's going to be called Gaston Louis Vuitton. And my grandfather was named Claude Louis Vuitton. You met Patrick Louis Vuitton, and my name is Pierre Louis Vuitton, sixth generation. And your brother's name? Benoît Louis, and I made sure that my children carried on the name. Where was Louis Vuitton born? In the Jura, in Anchet. What kind of family? It was a rural environment. His father had a mill, and life around them was about farming. How did he come to Paris? He left home at 13. 13? Yes, 13. And never to return. Did he know how to read and write? I think. Just barely. He left at 13. And when did he reach Paris? Uh, from what I understand, it took him two years to get to Paris. There he got himself hired by a certain Mr. Maréchal, 
who happened to be a prominent emballeur on the Paris scene. He would learn his trade with him for about 15 years. Was Monsieur Maréchal already in luxury trunk making? Yeah, yeah, already. Okay. At the time, when Louis was starting out, there were 200 to 300 truck makers in Paris. He wasn't alone. Oh, okay. He set up shop on Rue des Capucines in 1854. So he moved here, learned his trade here, and built up his clientele in that district. He soon started looking for places where he could build his luggage, because it took up so much space. At first, he went looking on the Rue du Rocher near Saint-Lazare. Okay, I see. It was a small workshop. Then in 1859, he found a plot of land here in Anières. It was the countryside at the time, and he came to live here. It was very convenient for him because it was the first railway line departing from Paris and heading towards Saint-Germain-en-Laye. As a result, he had a direct line to his shop. Then there was the Seine, not far off, which he could use to bring in raw materials and timber. When did Louis Vuitton start to become internationally known? It was George who opened the international front. His son? George went to study in Jersey and became fluent in English. It was he who realized at some point that his customers were travelers and would need to be addressed where they lived. And it was him who got the story started in London and later in the United States. The first international shop was in London? In London, yes. And Gaston started to get active from when? When was the third generation? Gaston was, let's say, more the beginning of the 20th century. And he's the one who started the collection, amassing all kind of trunks. Yeah. Because you can see other trunks in the Anyard dining room. So these are the trunks from his collection. Are they Vuitton trunks? They're not Vuitton trunks, no, no. What kind of trunks are they? They look like they've just been rolled off a Spanish galleon. Yeah, yeah, that's right. How many did he collect? Well, actually, so Gaston was a collector. He collected everything. He would archive. He was interested in everything. He would collect. He was the first person to start writing the history of the Vuitton family. So what I mean is Louis and George didn't leave many traces behind. And in fact, at some point, he's the one who started wondering about the family's history. So he would write, ask around. He went to find the house in the Jura. And then he started collecting trunks along with all sorts of things. He was well, a collector and a curious mind. That was just his personality. He was someone curious. So we have only talked about guys. Were there any women in the history of Louis Vuitton or not? <laughs> there were a few, yes. Who are the women at Louis Vuitton? Do we know who Louis Vuitton's wife was? Oh yes, yeah, of course. We know the whole genealogy. They didn't take much part in the company, did they? No, 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 they did. They were there to keep the house running. You know, they, they were there. My granny, Gaston's wife, would take over the business in 1970. After Gaston died, for example. Oh, right. So she was very much there at that point. There was a bit of a matriarchy at one point. A bit, yeah, yeah, definitely. That's reassuring. <laughs> Who comes to Anier today? And what can people see when they come to visit? So, when people come to visit, they come to see the family home because it has a nice feel right. and is splendid to see. So there's a permanent exhibition of trunks. There's a really stunning exhibition of male trunks. Vuitton's original trunk, the Mall Courrier, which he created in 1859. It's gray. So the first one was Trianon gray. You can't tell it's a Vuitton trunk at all because the locks aren't stamped. The metal parts aren't stamped and there's no logo on the canvas. The only sign that it's a Vuitton trunk is the way it's made. Because there's already that initial touch, that initial know-how. And then the label inside, Louis Vuitton en valeur. Okay, how old was he when he made that first trunk? Just over 30. Okay. So those are the first Grey Vuitton trunks. And very quickly he realized that at some point he had to set himself apart from other trunk makers. And he came up with the famed red and beige striped canvas that can be seen from around 1876 on. And you start to see on certain metal parts, like the buckles, a little LV or Louis Vuitton. So there it was. You start to see a bit of the product's identity appear on the outside. 
which was revolutionary at the time. It wouldn't have occurred to anyone to do that. It was quite revolutionary, yes. And what would truly be revolutionary was the second, the sequel. In other words, the checkered canvas with Louis Vuitton, the registered trademark. So in this case, it's my canvas. I identified it, I trademarked it, and it has been patented. So that means anyone who decides to copy me should watch out because I'm going to make trouble for them. And so it's a Vuitton trunk, not because it's checkered, because it's a checkered pattern with Louis Vuitton. It's a way of signing an excellence, no? Yeah, absolutely. It's already a Louis Vuitton luxury trunk. With Louis, the funny thing is that he would see gray, striped, and checkered, and he wouldn't see the monogram. Paradoxical. Why is it called the mail trunk? To hark back to the time of airmail. You know, when you have a plane, you talk about long haul and medium haul lines, transport lines, right? Letters, courrier in French. So the mail trunk or mal courrier is something that can take you far away. Yeah, that's it. It will haul your personal belongings to the other side of the world. The mal courrier was designed to carry fine linens. As a result, it's never been very fitted outside and often contains just the frame. Sometimes, on the older mal courrier, you can see hat boxes or little cases for lingerie, but never anything too complex. It's when you get to the wardrobe or secretary desk models that the complexity becomes much greater. The secretary desk trunks often have a watch secretary with all these compartments and slots for watches. I was fascinated by the secretary trunks. <laughs> it's great. Also at Vuitton, we have every model, from the single watch trunk to the secretary watch trunk, which I think can contain 150 watches. 150 watches! <laughs> Are people really traveling with it? Or is it more a treasure chest for the home? Today we have to be aware that yes, people are traveling less with our products. That being said, when you make a Vuitton trunk, you have to always keep in mind that it must be able to travel. This trunk is incredible. It's a beauty, huh? What is it? This is the flower trunk. It's one of my favorite. The idea for the flower trunk came from George, who one day realized that when his customers came to him to order trunks, ladies often left without anything. In the end, the gentleman left with his trunks, but the lady left a bit empty-handed. So if it's short, that means it's roughly early 20th century. Yeah, that's right, 1910. So he came up with a smaller version of the mal courrier as a gift for the ladies, with a zinc tub inside that could hold both flowers and water. In other words, we could add real flowers and then give this trunk to the lady, who then came away with her flowers. Later, the zinc tub could be removed and used as a jewelry box. How about you? What's your favorite trunk? Well, I get asked that question a lot, and what I say is there are these three models. There's the male trunk, because it has been with us from Louis right up to the present day and is still virtually the same. So I find it's really interesting to have this trunk that has been with us for 170 years. Which is actually eternal. It truly is. There's the flower trunk, because I think the story I told you, it's really superb and it's really a pretty object. And I always remember when we talk about special orders. It was my father, Patrick Louis Vuitton, who made the Biston, a clothes rack. When it comes to Vuitton clothes rack, there's the Coup de Ville, the Biston, and the Alzer. Alzer, how do you spell it? A-L-Z-E-R. Okay, is that a French word? Yeah, these are made-up names. Ah, the neologism. It's our little house secret, yes. So, the Biston is an in-between piece of luggage. Pierre Boulez asked my father for a luggage. Pierre Boulez, the composer? The composer, yes. I see. He had asked him for a piece of luggage to carry all his equipment that he carried around. What did he need to carry? Conductor sticks? Batons, sheet music, his pencils, and his, at the time, his Walkman, which was the novelty of the time. So this was in the mid-80s? Yeah, 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 in the 80s. And so my father gathered all of Pierre Boulez's equipment at home in order to size the special made-to-measure order, just to get it right. Were there kind of pop culture moments where you could say, hey, the Vuitton trunk is really becoming famous now? Well, there was one pretty interesting moment. In fact, George had gone on to become very proud of all the inventions around the trunk. There were quite a few of them. And one of the inventions he launched was the lock. His customers needed to secure their luggage, to lock their luggage before placing it in the hold of a ship. It had to be a trunk that no one could open. So George set out to make a non-pick lock. A non-pick lock? I see. Yeah, that's the purpose, of course. It was a lock that can't be picked, with a single key for the customer. 
He came up with a system inside, featuring a code, a key made from a code, with three digits initially. Emballer and locksmith, in other words. Exactly. So he came up with this lock, and the customers each had their own lock with their own key and key number. And Arsène Lupin couldn't do anything about it? <laughs> well, it follows that Arsène Lupin couldn't do anything about it. He was so proud of his invention that at one point, a certain Harry Houdini, a magician, you know, the one who could break free of any bonds and chains. He was extremely famous. Yeah, he was extremely famous. So at one point, he challenged Houdini. He sent a message to Houdini. He produced this big poster saying to Houdini, come see me, come to the Alhambra, come, I'll lock you up in a truck my way, and you just try to get out. <laughs> a spectacular publicity stunt. <laughs> but also potentially a recipe for disaster because there was nothing Houdini couldn't overcome. Well, the thing is, Harry Houdini never showed up for the challenge. So George thought to himself, if Harry Houdini didn't turn up, then my trunks are secure. And I imagine it had a big splash at the time. Yeah, of course, it made a huge splash. So the exhibition shows trunks, trunks from that time up to the present? Up to the present. We have yesterday's models in gray. We have the trunks in zinc, for example. At the end of the 19th century, with the great explorations in Africa and Asia, there was a need for much sturdier trunks to cross the continents. Trunks that stand up to the humidity and weather of those regions. So to reinforce them, instead of using canvas, we use zinc sheeting to reinforce the trunks. The amusing thing is that Pharrell Williams reused this wonderful idea of metal trunks on his catwalk show, and as a result is making a copper trunk today. He had this little cart going down the catwalk. People were going wild. Yeah, well, the passage is great. What I like is that we people use our archives and our history to create something new. And that's just fantastic. Did Virgil Abloh make trunks? Yes. He's done several. What did we see? I think he made a plane. He did the plane. That's it. The plane was in the show. How do you react when you first see the projects? So, yeah, it's a drawing, it's materials, it's color codes. And then we have the model makers who work from these sketches and start to make an initial model. It can take one or two weeks. It's really very quick. Things usually happen very late with respect to the show dates, so we need to be efficient and fast. Oh, you do? Is that like a countdown? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, it's very tightly regimented. You have 15 days left and you need 16, something like that. And we've barely got the materials, and we've got to go. We've got to get it out there. So here we have really talented people who know how to work, to analyze sketches, cut the materials, sew bags from almost from nothing, and produce models for the catwalk. Virgil Abloh is also someone who had you making these huge trunks to hold sports equipment and stuff like that. Yeah, recently. We made golf trunks with all the golf equipment inside and a little mat inside to practice on. For example, with Nicolas Gisquier's pyramid trunk, I remember we worked on the model. We received the parts three weeks or two weeks before the show, and we had to get this famous pyramid out there. <laughs> that was a great experience. <laughs> In Mark Jacob's time, I think you had some nice races against the clock. Yes, well, but that's the rule with the shows. When Mark Jacobs comes by, does he place special orders? Well, he had ordered a trunk for his dog. Exceptionally, we had created a big trunk, 1.6 meters by 60 centimeters. <laughs> yes, Mark Jacobs' dog is huge. He's called Neville, I think. He has an Instagram account with lots of followers. <laughs> Absolutely. So, to transport him by plane, we made him a trunk so he could take his dog with him. I don't know if it was a trunk. Yes, it was a trunk that was handed over to carry Choupette, Karl Lagerfeld's cat. Okay. Karl Lagerfeld was so happy. I've rarely seen Karl Lagerfeld as happy as he was that day. So, it's true that we're doing some of those again. 
but generally it was a bit of a no-no in the Maison to make trunks for animal transport. As for Karl Lagerfeld, we've also done a special order for his iPod and iPod speakers. Yes, I saw him traveling with them. He had a lot of trunks. I counted once when he was going to the Mercer Hotel. I filmed the packing process and there were 26 trunks. Oh, yeah, that is a lot. But what's nice, on top of it all, is the customers who travel with their trunks. So I'm quite happy to see that these products are traveling. They're made to be transported. And I imagine that when people see all these Louis Vuitton trunks carrying sports trophies from huge international competitions, others come in the day after the finals because they are broadcast worldwide. I imagine that yes, it makes you want to have one. So special order customers think to themselves, I've got something too, and I'd like to be able to transport it. <laughs> have you done two or three trunks like that? Do you need to have what will be inside the custom-made trunk, the trophy? Sometimes it's hard. Do you sometimes need to do special cuts? Yeah, nowadays with digital technology and 3D, we can do a lot of things. Don't you have the World Cup trophy coming up? Yeah, yeah, the FIFA World Cup trophy came to Anya. No way. Yeah, in an armored truck. I imagine there's a whole security escort. The trunk maker worked with two bodyguards. <laughs> no way. He must have been sweating. <laughs> It was a tremendous experience. No shaking allowed. Yeah, yeah, but it was the only way to have a box that was okay and fit properly. The World Cup trophy. They also told me they made the trunk for Vermeer's painting, the milkmaid. Yeah, the milkmaid. Yeah, that's right. That's just wild. I still can't get over it. It's our job. And on the old trunk labels, you see Louis Vuitton Packmaker. In fact, the principle of packing at the time, in the 19th century, was tell me what are the objects you want to transport and I'll make you the perfect packaging that goes around it. I'll transport the items for you and unpack them on arrival. Then, with all this packaging, I will put it in a wooden crate initially, and then the wooden crate, it was worked on a bit further, and we made sure that this wooden crate was something we could reuse. And it's become the Mal de Louis trunk today. Louis trunk <laughs> with all those locks. So on the floor of this exhibition, what can we see? So on the exhibition floor, it's more of a cabinet of curiosities. It's a bit of a reminder of what Gaston had. Gaston was kind of a collector, as I mentioned. He had objects from everywhere. So we kind of recreated in the same atmosphere his cabinet of curiosities. Along with vanity cases, right? And smaller formats? What's funny about the rigid products is that they really do come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, they range from the very small to the very large, up to a meter forty in height. And what's really amusing is when you teach a trunk maker how to make a rigid case, you're actually teaching him a skill. But this trunk maker will be able to produce both very small and very large products. It's the same know-how from one product to the next. Match boxes? Excuse me? I don't think we've made any matchboxes, but we'll make a matchbox. Oh, well, I've originated an idea. What I found interesting was that when the Maison celebrated its bicentennial, it was the trunk that attracted all the attention. There were these 200 trunks interpreted by all kinds of people, Peter Marino, the K-pop group BTS, and they ended up in all the windows of the most famed avenues around the world. Spotlight on the trunk. focus on the but the trunk is our history. Louis Vuitton has been a trunk maker since 1854. That's our history. Even if we've gone into leather goods and other fields, Louis Vuitton is a trunk maker. It's rigid. <laughs> are there famous puns on the trunks? There are puns about the trunks. <laughs> yes. It was Sasha Guitry who said of George, no one has ever made me feel as truncated as you have. <laughs> What's neat about this maison is, when you come here, you're really in touch with the workshop. How many employees are there? Uh, today, there are 200 of them. 200 people? What fascinates everyone is the special orders. How does it work? If I know what I want and I have an idea for a special order, do I have to come to Anya or can I just walk into my nearest Vuitton store? Well, coming to Anya is a bit of a reward. 
But let's just say, in our shops all over the world, there are people who are able to take your request, guide you through the special order process, and understand your needs or the object that needs to be transported. And behind them are the teams from Anier, whose job is to make them a reality. So are you going to introduce us? So we have Leah, who is a truck maker. Hello. And Marie, right? Hello. And Marie, who is responsible for special orders. When did you join the Maison, Marie? I joined Louis Vuitton in 2000. Not too shabby, a vintage. Exactly. And how about you? Three years ago. Three years ago. It will be three years in November. Okay, what made you want to join Louis Vuitton? I sold shoes to start with, and I was fed up with seeing small defects on the shoes. I wanted to go behind the curtain for a bit. So I earned the national certification in leatherworks and applied for a job at Louis Vuitton. I was trained on supple leather and ended up in rigid. And since then, I can't imagine myself doing supple anymore. So you were trained in supple materials outside of Vuitton and your training on rigid came inside of Vuitton? Yes, internally. And you? How did you get into Vuitton? Through my passion. I started working at the Champs-Élysées store in 2000, where I was part of the sales team and developed a passion for rigid luggage and trunks. And then I was given the opportunity to join the teams at Anya. What did you like about it? Was it the meticulousness? What drew you in? Everything. The fact that they had all these little compartments that you could see hidden compartments, somewhere you could keep contents hidden and transport them knowing they would be safe. I'm looking at this whiskey storage. The glasses and decanter won't budge a bit during transport. That has always been like magic to me. I've always been quite captivated by this know-how. This is a crystal decanter, right? Absolutely. And it won't break? Never. Now we have the cocktail dry trunk in the range as well, the contents of which also won't move during transport. I love how confident you are because I'd be nervous. Well, I guarantee you that's why we're all here. And since 1854, I don't think Pierre Louis will contradict me. We've never had any broken parts inside our trunks. So that means that if I place a special order, even from another continent, it will land on your desk? Is that it? Exactly. There will be a first estimate phase. We'll take a look and estimate your project, looking at the technical aspects and feasibility. And once you've accepted our estimate, it will go into production, where the team in leather work will produce the piece of luggage. Leah here, for example, has just worked on a box with special contents that I brought in from the Lyon shop and made. And what was the request? It was a box for toiletries accessories. Okay. For nail clippers, tweezers, that sort of thing. Okay. As a result, for a few weeks, I had my colleague in carpentry think about how to come up with drawers where everything could fit in properly, but still be held in place, and, as with the others, not move during transport. Do you also get to interact with them? Actually, I did get the opportunity to talk to this customer. It's extremely personal, in other words. Exactly. And the major point of contact is his salesperson in the shop. It's a moving or kind of nice report, isn't it? With people who talk directly with a maison. That's funny. It's the power of special orders. It's that today we become the link between our salesperson, the customer, and the product. And one of our strengths in Anier is that we know all our end customers. In other words, I know that this part is going to go to that country, that shop, and that customer. There are special endeavors sometimes, I imagine. The delivery must be a magical moment. It's the culmination of your project. It really is a sacred moment. What kind of wood do you use? It's poplar, if I'm not mistaken, normally. That's it, poplar. Why poplar? So, poplar is one of the lightest woods. Today, beech and oak are much heavier. What's more, it's a very flexible wood, which means that luggage can take a beating or become warped. But the trunk will never break. I'm probably saying something stupid here, but it's fragile, right? Yes, it's fragile, but it's the whole construction that we're going to have around the luggage that's going to make it indestructible. The tooling, the internal ribbing. What is ribbing? It's a cotton canvas that we put inside to line the interior and reinforce the inner side of the luggage. It's quite a paradox to have chosen a fragile wood to make something that isn't. It's a real paradox. No, it's not, because we chose a light wood. Let's say I want to use oak tomorrow. Oak is brittle and wouldn't be ideal. And it would be three times heavier when we're talking about luggage, which people will have to carry. Eventually. So the idea is to have a very light wood, the lightest possible. And poplar is one of the lightest woods, a flexible wood 
that will not warp during the journey. What about the oldest trunks we saw in the exhibition at Anier? Are they made of poplar? They're made of poplar, yes. Is it the original wood? It hasn't shifted? No, no, it hasn't shifted. It's the same know-how. What are some of your favorite stories? Recently, a fairly young customer came into the shop in a very nice car and asked us to make him some luggage quickly so that he could dress up the boot of his car. There you go, that was nice. It was in Paris on the Champs-Élysées, and so we created this piece. So you had a trunk wrap made? A trunk to put inside the boot of his car. Was the luggage an Eclipse? I think I was the one who made it. Hats off to you. What was it made of? Eclipse. What is Eclipse? It's this black canvas. Oh yeah, I see the black canvas where you can still see the monogram, but it's a bit black and black, isn't it? It's grey. Like nighttime. And he loved the piece so much that upon receiving it, he placed a second special order. It was great. The story goes on. What did he order? A Stokowski secretary trunk. What's that? In monogram eclipse. So in 1929, the conductor Leopold Stokowski... I don't know him. Don. He wrote the music for Fantasia. Ah, that I know. <laughs> well, he traveled a lot between London and New York, so he asked Gaston to make him a desk, uh, a trunk. A portable desk. A portable desk. And so he made him a secretary trunk with a door that opened and a desk that unfolded on one side. And on the other side, a whole cupboard with storage for his music, his books and his other personal belongings. Something Napoleon would have dreamed of. That's right. And so because he had his secretary trunk, he left with his desk and he settled into his hotel and his office, unfolded his desk and worked. And so this secretary, it's become a standard of the maison. We call it the Stokowski secretary. What did it feel like, Léa, when you first came to Anier in November 2020? Because this is Rue Louis Vuitton. Maybe you're not aware, when you arrive of the historic dimension of the Maison, were you aware of it or not? Not at all. I was very curious when I arrived, and in fact, the first thing I thought when I had my interview to join the atelier was that I found it had a real family-like feel. More than just being impressed by the name Louis Vuitton and everything around it, I found the atmosphere in the workshop very cozy. I felt at home and comfortable. And I think that's a good example of the great teamwork that goes on in the atelier. Even if you don't work in the same team, you can ask colleagues for advice all day long, for any product. We all end up working together and you can feel it in the atmosphere. You're not secluded at your workstation. You need to communicate to get by in the end, right? That's right. How do you explain this family-like feel, Pierre-Louis Vuitton? There's always been a family spirit here. As you can see, there's the family home and the atelier surrounding the family home. I lived here. There's always been both family and work. When Louis moved here, that's what he wanted. He wanted his own workshop and then built his house right next door so that he could easily navigate between his atelier and his studio. So there's always been a family life here. You can feel it in the teams even today. When we're in Agnès, it's true that we're all a bit together. We all know each other. It's not a very big atelier with less than 200 people. It's still quite large. Yeah, but we almost all know each other. I'm so happy to have spoken to you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Louis Vuitton Extended. I'll be inviting you soon to discover new stories in the company of visionary personalities. You will find all the episodes on your favorite listening platforms, such as Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You should subscribe to the podcast to get notifications so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. I look forward to welcome you back.